Hello, welcome everyone to another Rocket Dollar educational webinar. Uh, this is our second one of uh, 2024. You can also catch our first webinar on precious metals just uh, from last week on YouTube or recordings. Um, but why do we do these webinars? Um, we do these because not uh, everyone knows all the different asset classes that you can invest in with a self-directed IRA. Some of our clients have done plenty of different alternatives deals before. Some um, you know, have maybe just done one real estate deal or they're just kind of exploring this for the first time. Um, so we do those these so people can be aware of what's out there and also so people can ask questions of you know, Rocket Dollar is a retirement company. How how do these specific investments really react or fit into um, a self-directed IRA uh, or solo 401k? So nothing in this is investment advice, but we're really excited. We've got Kevin Bildenhausen today from Fruition Capital uh, that's going to give us a great presentation. So Kevin, why don't you introduce yourself today? Sure. So um, my name is Kevin Bebelhausen. Happy to be here. I'm a principal with Fruition Capital, and um, we invest in small businesses in what's called acquisition entrepreneurship. Are you guys ready for me to share my screen and everything? Yeah, go ahead. Rock and roll then. All right. So this is a little bit about us. Um, so we, uh, we're, this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the opportunity in the market, um, operating businesses as an asset class, um, vehicles to access the asset class, the different ways you can involve, be involved in investing in small businesses, uh, and then what our strategy is and how the fund is set up with all the numbers and everything at the end. A um, little bit about me. So the thesis for Fruition Capital and what we do is we go out and we, uh, we back qualified uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, typically, they're out of a corporate background, but they're looking for uh, the next phase of their career. They're looking to take over an existing business. And we uh, are the equity gap, uh, or we cl help close the equity gap by uh, by pooling investment from, from investors like you uh, to, to help uh, uh, close that equity gap and, and give the uh, give the sponsor uh, the ability to close on on a deal that they otherwise wouldn't have able to have access to. And then there's, you know, obviously, uh, great economics for the investors uh, and great economics for the sponsor. So it really is a win-win. I've gone through this process before. Um, I've, I, in fact, I'm sitting in the office of the business that I acquired, um, and I've, I've got a firm, Black Sales Strategies, that that is acquiring businesses in the southeastern region of the U.S. Um, one of the, you know, one of the great things about uh, this space is, you know, how active it is right now and how it's becoming a very um, popular asset class. There's lots of really qualified entrepreneurs uh, or want to be entrepreneurs uh, and operators and managers who are interested in in taking over a business. And um, we kind of get to be a part of that. And we're kind of at the leading edge uh, of professionalizing this asset class. So uh, we're talking a little bit about small business, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, you know, some of you may have heard of uh, the silver tsunami or, you know, a bunch of businesses that are owned, owned by baby boomers who are going to be retiring and need a liquidity event. And there there either isn't anybody in the uh, in the family that's willing to take over the business. There isn't somebody who's well capitalized enough that they know whatever the reason is, um, these 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 businesses need to transition. Um, and so you can see here, you know, there's more concentration than ever before in this single generation uh, with greater than 55% businesses owned by baby boomers. And we affectionately call this the silver tsunami. So if you ever go on like Twitter or LinkedIn or anything, you're going to see that, that buzzword everywhere. Um, our sweet spot really is, is looking in the one to $2 million EBITDA range. Uh, so we look for businesses that are actually uh, main, we call it like main street plus or premium main street. So they're, they're small enough to be uh, to be unattractive for private equity, they're just you know usually private equity likes to be in that two plus million dollars EBITDA, really more three million and, and above. And then you have the mom and pop investors who are usually under a million dollars in EBITDA, and we like to be in sort of that no man's land, you know, where there's there's a company that's that's uh, that's been performing really well uh, for whatever reason, you know, it's kind of stayed in this in this box. Maybe it just needs new leadership and. Uh, and a new, you know, new vision, uh, new energy to kind of bring the business forward. But that's where we find the most value. Uh, and when we uh, when we go out uh, and and work with our sponsors, our entrepreneurs, 
um, the they're they're going and getting uh, SBA debt. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about SBA debt later and, and kind of how all that works out. But uh, it essentially gives them access to uh, to deals or this is sort of pushing the SBA loan to its limit as far as uh, the leverage that you could put on a business. Um, and so that obviously impacts the returns, you know, for the equity too, because you're putting in pretty a pretty thin slice of equity in these deals and capitalizing it mostly with debt. Okay. Um, Quick, uh, Kevin, can we pause? Yeah. We've thrown a lot of acronyms out in the last uh, ne last few minutes. So um, we just SM. Someone asked what SMB meant early on. Is that small and? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So SMB SMB is smaller medium sized businesses. Okay, and then um, we already had. Uh, uh, EBIT, EBITDA, which I know is... EBITDA, I, I thought about that one as I was saying it. So EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, and amortization. Okay. Um, so it's, just, it's a proxy. You can call it for cash flow. Um, it's what all businesses... It's a it's a standard accounting metric that all businesses are are sort of measured on. So you have your revenue, you have your you know cost of goods and everything. And then the bottom line is your EBITDA. Yeah. And you'll always see uh, private equity people or accounting people online or throwing that around... Some because they know what it is. Some of they just want to sound smart. Yeah. Uh, the SBA, yeah. um, you know, the Small Business Administration, I believe. Small Business Administration. Yeah, I didn't realize that I was going through uh, the the acronyms. Sort of like it feels like you know a bunch of military acronyms, but I mean they are kind of all, a lot of government acronyms. The SBA is Small Business Administration, which is a government entity. So what these what these sponsors are doing, and so I'll just speak for myself since I did this. So um, we would go out to um, we would go and find a deal. And I'm I'm very much oversimplifying uh, the complexity of that. But you go out and you find a deal. Um, you negotiate and you go to a bank and you say, "Hey, this is the business I want to buy." Um, and the bank, if they're they're a SBA lender, meaning they've got like a preferred status with the SBA, um, the the bank is actually able to make a loan on these businesses for acquisition. They can be used for working capital too, uh, so for an existing owner, but for our purposes, we're using it as an acquisition loan. So they come and say, okay, I will, uh, for this particular business, you know, it's doing one and a half million dollars uh, in EBITDA, in, in cash flow, you could say. Um, and, you know, we'll leave you, we'll, we'll give you, uh, you know, $5 million, which is the SBA max. And then you can make up the rest with equity, maybe some seller financing. So if you're if you're familiar, you know, if you've invested in real estate before, um, you know, some of those deals are seller financed. So th there's oftentimes a portion of these deals that are uh, seller financed. And that's so the capital stack will look something like, you know, 80 percent senior debt, 10 percent uh, seller financing, 10 percent equity injection. That's that's a pretty standard breakout of what uh, of what these capital stacks look like when acquiring a business. Did I uh, did I get all the acronyms? Yes, you did. I just put them in the chat yeah. too. Just um, and I know some some of our users, frankly, and our investors, they know all these backwards and forwards. But we yeah yeah sure aren't left behind. So not a problem. Yeah, no, not a problem. That's that's I think. Yeah, it's kind of common where you just start kind of going off and uh, and and forgetting that you know there's uh, there's people who just may not have been exposed to this yet, and that's what we're here to do. So one of the nice things about this uh, this space right now is that because there's a lot of retiring baby boomers, there's a lot of supply. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interest in exiting a business. You know, I talk to people every day, sellers, potential sellers, current owners of businesses, 65 ish. Um, who you know they their kids aren't interested in the business and they they need to exit and so they they have the opportunity to you know they can either go sell to a strategic so a bigger player in the industry so a larger company in the same vertical they could uh, they could sell to private equity um, or they could uh, sell to one of our sponsors who comes in as a regular entrepreneur, big business owner, just like the people they're buying from, um, it's it's a lot less uh, it's a lot less intimidating to deal with you know somebody like me or any of our other you know entrepreneurs because we're re we're regular people, we're not private equity firms, and we're looking to uh, you know be good stewards of the business. We're not looking to go in and just do a bunch of cost cutting and try and squeeze blood from a rock. Um, it's it's a sustainable model. You know, we're not going in there and trying to, you know, just flip a business like in, in sort of the traditional private equity world of the the five to seven year hold period. Um, 
the last thing I'll say on this slide is just that we've got some really great uh, people uh, in our roster right now as far as entrepreneurs go. We've got um, a number of, of MBAs. Um, we have a, a sponsor that just finished his MBA at Harvard um, and and uh, and bought a uh, bought a company. Um, but it's it's being taught more in these business school uh, programs uh, where they're presenting, you know, these these otherwise qualified corporate candidates the option to go out and and do something on their own that they may not have known was possible. Uh, and most of them don't know what's possible. I can I can tell you from firsthand, you know, going to Duke, um, uh, we had a lot of, uh, and this is actually quite interesting, that we had a lot of veterans and exiting military who are very interested in doing this. My theory behind this is that, you know, they've, they've spent 20 years in the military taking orders from everybody. Uh, and they'd really like to not take orders from somebody, and but they've got all this leadership experience to to put into action. And so I can't tell you how many veterans I've talked to or uh, who are interested in doing something like this. So it's a it's a, a very hot topic at a lot of business schools right now. The um, uh, and Bunker and Labs are here in Austin and also Chicago as well. They've become a national organization, and that's just really to kind of support some of these people coming out of yeah veteran positions into more corporate um, positions and slide into that better. Yeah, for sure. This um, this slide just kind of talks about the difference in in a couple different asset classes. So I know you guys, if you're if you're a regular attender of this webinar, uh, you get you know, you get exposure to all kinds of different asset classes. Um, this this is obviously a, a brief snapshot of, you know, kind of the, the the ones that we typically put ourselves up against, you know, publicly traded equities in the top right. That's sort of the benchmark for everybody. Um, that's your S&P 500. That's, you know, stocks that you all know about. Right. Um, in the bottom, uh, I like to think about. So the, the people that I feel like we're we're really kind of competing with or or the people that I like to compare us to are a lot of the startup, the venture investors. Because uh, in a lot of ways, it's a similar model where you uh, where you're you're kind of seeding with smaller checks, and, and there's possibility for uh, for outsized returns. But in venture, it's a lot of small bets, and most of them fail. Uh, and you can see it's it's very illiquid. Um, requires you know a large amount of capital if you're at if you're at the um, the fund level and you're you're just pouring money into some of these businesses that don't have a go to market strategy that don't have product market fit et cetera et cetera um, the nice thing about what we do in investing in these operating businesses is that they trade at reasonable multiples so when you buy a business you you buy a business based on a multiple of EBITDA so earnings before interest taxes, amortization that we discussed before, you buy on like a three to five times multiple of that EBITDA and that's sort of your enterprise value, okay? Now, multiples can be higher for sure. The bigger the business, the higher the multiple, the stronger you know, the revenue, the higher quality revenue, um, higher the multiple. So there's all kinds of things that, that impact that. But the, the great thing is that they, they fail less than startups. Why? Because they've already been in operation for 10 plus years. You know, they've already got a customer base. They've already got product market fit. You know, so you're not you're not funding a company that is trying to figure out who they are. You're funding a company that has an established uh, has established cash flow, strong tax advantages. When we buy these companies, we often buy them with real estate, and so there's depreciation we can pass along. Uh, so it's a little more tax efficient. Um, you you do have it. It is a private, difficult market to access. You have to either kind of like private equity where you need to build this network of people in order to get deal flow. If you if you want to be a direct investor, I'll tell you, it's incredibly difficult. I know some very uh, high up, like big law type attorneys who who just really enjoy cherry picking deals and, and investing directly. Um, it's a lot of work. You got to really love doing that. And that's why we feel the fund model is good for most people, because most people don't have the bandwidth to underwrite a lot of deals like we do. Uh, and then, of course, you do have a sponsor, uh, Key Man Risk. That's why we vet our sponsors. Uh, we do background checks. We look at, you know, their their obviously their educational track record, their their work track record, if they've owned a business before, um, what their goals are in, in acquiring this business. So we do a we do a pretty thorough diligencing of our sponsors uh, to mitigate as much of that Key Man Risk as possible. Yeah, just um, on the taxes, Kevin. You can go yeah. back to the slide with the taxes. 
So just know that there's the taxes impacting the business owner themselves. Right. And then there's also you as an IRA investor. So you might be shielded from most things, but you know, like this business owner owning one or two real estate properties might be advantage from them thinking more as like the investment I'm actually going into. So just know that there's there's kind of two tax realms, the actual business owner itself, and then you coming in with your IRA or your solo 401k, you might have your own taxes. Um, and uh, I won't even go into UBIT taxes. That's another scary act. Everybody consult your tax professional, right? Like we're, we're, we can, we can give you a sort of basic uh, understanding here, but, but it's, it's obviously much more complicated. So no, yeah, I appreciate, appreciate the clarification there. Anything else you want to talk about on this slide or any other questions? Um, yeah, just the, I think the multiples observation you had, you know, on startups, um, you know, I hear a lot of feedback from investors, you know, they'll come to us and they'll call and it might be extremely early, you know, and they're, that you know they're getting such a good um you know initial investment uh, uh valuation that they're going in but that business is still finding out who they are they might not even have yep. sold a single product yet like not even one dollar of revenue yet um they uh then i also hear the opposite complaint of people going into much much later rounds and their feedback is look I'm late. I hope to still get a bump about this, but I'm kind of at the mercy of the rest of the market. And I just kind of want to hitch on and hopefully I'll be on the ride. So more of that sweet spot, I think you're trying to talk about where there's 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 not a desperate sink or swim attitude right in the first six months to a year of the business, but they're more in control of their own destiny. Um, and you can make that decision. hundred percent in the cash flow of the business that you, that, that that's acquired finances, the, the growth. I mean, you can always go out and you can get, you know, more working capital and different lines of credit and stuff to, to grow the business. But the beauty of doing what we're doing is that you're buying an existing business that's already cash flow positive. You know, we, we're not going to buy anything. That's not, that's not kicking off cash that it, it wouldn't be saleable. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's a huge, uh, that's a huge benefit in, in our column. And, and it's a benefit for you as an investor, because we make distributions every year. So this cash that, you know, let's say we make eight investments across fund one, right. And maybe five of them return cash in the first year. Well, that cash gets distributed, you know? So it's unlike, unlike venture investing, unlike startup investing, where you put your money in and you're like, well, maybe I'll see that money again in five to seven years. Uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see if they go public. We'll see if there's a liquidity event. Um, with with investing in operating businesses, investing in small businesses like we do, you know, they're cash flow positive from day one, and we're distributing cash the the first year. Um, you know, obviously that's subject to all the the businesses' performances and everything, but law of averages over over the portfolio, we're going to be distributing cash in the first year. So yeah, huge. And, uh the last okay. observation we've had a few, you know, we get private equity firms that come and approach us sure. and some, you know, some, obviously their investors love them. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some deals that don't work out, but I, I'd look very carefully to see if a private equity firm is taking over that business. Do they know that business? Well, have they successfully had a track record in that same industry? Those are the ones I see coming to us where they seem like they're strong. They have a lot of investors compared to ones that might be, you know, like you're saying, if, if they don't know the business well, they could probably cut costs on it. Anyone can. But like, is that business going to survive three, four right. years after um, from the veteran employees speaking up like, no, don't cut this cost. It's essential to me to keep things going. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's sort of the, the knock against sort of big private equity is that they come in and they just kind of want to slash and burn uh, and do operational efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all that's that's a lot of times just short term thinking. Um and you're going to have a problem down the road. So there's a, a few different ways to access this asset class that we're talking about. Um, I'm, I'm going to start at the bottom and kind of work my way up because that's probably a better logical flow. So you have the direct investment in a in a business. So imagine me kind of coming to you as an investor. I've got your email or your phone number or whatever I've got, and I call you and I say, hey. I'm raising money. I'm raising, you know, for my deal specifically, I raised $800,000 in equity. I went to uh, quite a few investors and and asked, you know, my minimum check size was 50,000, so I was going around and asking, you know, for direct investment in my business. This is before for, we started Fruition Capital. Um and so all the investors for my business are direct investors in my company. 
Now there's it's there's nothing wrong with being a direct investor in a business. You often have a little bit more control. Um, you don't have the the economics of a fund, so you don't have the fee structure. That's really nice. It's a lot more work, but you it's nice. Um, but you have to be in control of your own diversification. You have to there's there's some downsides too. And then, so what happened was then the next level up is search funds were created and they've been around for 10 years. If you're interested in some, uh, in some reading, you can go find the Stanford study on search funds. It's sort of a, it's sort of like a seminal work, uh, of this space. Um, and Stanford sort of pioneered this, um, this idea, but basically what it is, is, um, uh, there's a fund established around usually an MBA graduate. And that person raises, let's just say search capital. So they raise search capital of three to $500,000 from a pool of investors that they live off of. Then it's a salary, say they pay themselves $150,000 a year for two years to look for a business. And then these investors then have the option to invest in the deal that this sponsor finds or doesn't find, and they dissolve the fund and they're out of their money and everybody moves on. That's pretty common. Um, it's a it's that model is changing a little bit and then we've we've sort of iterated uh on top of that so there's now what's what's called there's self-funded search which is what what i did and what what all of our entrepreneurs do which is they don't take a salary from from us or from from anybody they fund themselves they are self-funded uh they fund their search so they either they work a job uh part-time they consult they do whatever they need to do to pay their bills, but they're also hustling, looking for deals uh, to to get under LOI and start the negotiation process and and get to close. Um, so there's not the initial there's not the um, uh, the investor issue of investing in somebody who may or may not find a business. By the time we're investing in a business at Fruition Capital, it's it's already under contract. And right. you the don't question have I have about these search funds, Kevin, is that traditionally just like they go and they find just one business, one business only, or would they maybe try and find like three or four totally different ones? No, uh, the search funds are are formed just around one single entity. Okay. So it'll be, yeah. So they raise, it's each, each fund is typically around, I mean, sometimes there'll be search partners. So it'll be around one or two people who want to go into, who want to be CEO, operator, whatever they're going to be. And then they raise the money in order to basically finance themselves, finance their mm -hmm. full-time job to search for two years. And then there's the option for investors to invest on the back end. Right. Um, yeah. So what we're doing is almost eliminating that first step and basically just saying, come talk to us for equity when you have a deal. You know, however you get there is fine with us. You want to go full-time search and live off the savings. You want to work a job. Uh, and that's what I did. I continued working. Um, however you want to do it, you know, just bring us the deal. And if it's under contract, we'll consider it. Yeah. Um, so, and what our fund does is we, we unlike search funds, which is what you were talking about, we, we pool investment into, uh, into a portfolio. So we're looking at investing our fund one will probably end up eight investments or so right now we've, we've finished five investments, uh, in fund one, um, so uh, your money that you would put in would be diversified across these eight businesses. Uh, and, you know, you, you would get the benefits of, you know, the diversification there and hedging risk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions on sort of this kind of bottom up approach and how, how we got to where we are now? Yeah, just an observation. Feel free to type in the Q&A, anyone, if you have one. But, you know, with like a real estate fund, I've seen, um, uh, you know, funds do the same like kind of search. Hey, we don't really have a property yet, but we're in a search. But that frankly can sometimes they'll they'll get that found in like six months or under. But it's a very different type of business. A multifamily property is kind of self-explanatory. You know, once you have a handyman look through it and, you, and those people run numbers, they kind of already like know exactly how much money that they're going to make. In your type of business, there's other factors of uncertainty that you you probably need time to work out. I assume. Yeah, diligence, and we can certainly go into this. Um, in fact, 
let's go into a little bit of diligence now because if if you've if you've never if you've if you're familiar with real estate diligence it is a little different it's a little more complicated like you said there are just more there are just more things that are going on uh each business is unique but a multifamily property is typically the same as you know it can be more analogous to a different multifamily property et cetera et cetera none of these businesses look alike the fundamentals are the same but the way the company is structured how they how they do uh different processes uh how they do their books that's one of the that's one of the ones that's very challenging um uh ask me how i know um you know so all of this is you got to go through and we do we do three or four forms of due diligence. You do your financial due diligence. So all of our searchers, all of our uh, sponsors, uh, entrepreneurs are going out and getting a quality of earnings study. And all that is, is it's basically an accounting firm that goes through the, the seller's books and rebuilds the P&L from bank statements, credit card statements, um, all that kind of stuff. So we basically verify that the business does actually bring in the cash they say it does. So they have to do their financial due diligence. Then they do their legal due diligence. Uh, and so you you hire a you know an M and A attorney who goes through and makes sure there's no liens against anything and makes sure that everything's you know on the up and up and there's no lawsuits there's no anything like this. Um, so they go and do that and then you obviously need them to negotiate a purchase agreement. Um, you'll do operational due diligence like how does this business run like what what is who's in charge of what process how does how does this business make money how does it go from A to Z. You know, where does how does what do all the steps look like uh, in order to 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 generate the revenue that that this business is accustomed to receiving? So there's different you know checks like that that we go through uh, when we're evaluating these businesses. And you know, fortunately, we have a, a very strong network of of, uh, of service partners who uh, who usually handle this for our, uh, our 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 entrepreneurs. They shouldn't do it on their own. Uh, they need to hire qualified professionals, and we we definitely encourage them to do that. And re well, we require them to do it uh, for the fund. Um, I, I I personally recommend it to anybody who's who's looking to buy a business, uh, but specifically for a fund, they have to do it. Um, so diligence is very important in the, in these uh, in these businesses, uh, especially at the lower end of of the middle market, which is kind of where we play in that one to two million dollar EBITDA range. I assume so here's you have what look very good go Rolodex of accountants and lawyers in your fund. I've never met as many accountants and lawyers as I had in the last three years since I've I've been back in this space. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And the the amount of the amount of action that they're seeing. I know a firm that started last year, uh, a, a legal firm. Couple guys. That's there's there's three attorneys. Uh, they're all former big law attorneys. So Kirkland Ellis, Kravif, uh, you know, I, I forget where they get some done. Um, all the really, you know, a couple big, big, big law firms. They quit and they started this boutique firm for small businesses for SMB acquisitions. They did almost a billion dollars in transactions last year. Wow. This this firm alone. Okay. So the the market is incredibly active. On this, uh, and there's there's really 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 qualified people who are kind of sick of the big private equity, big M and A, you know, working for people like Elon Musk and doing Facebook and all these different kind of M and A deals that are out there, and they're coming to help, you know, the guy that's trying to buy a plumbing company or the guy that's trying to buy a towing company, and you know, there it's it's unbelievable the amount of talent that 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 this that the service kind of world for this space has kind of popped up and, and matured in the last few years. Well, they both don't um, want a boss, it seems like the lawyer and also the business owner coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a couple observations here, you know, deal size. I think that's always something for um clients they're getting more used to using a rocket dollar account and alternative assets that's like a big thing that's very very different than the public markets you know there's mid caps big caps small caps but it yeah. usually doesn't like concern most clients and their investing strategy they're not looking too closely at that deal size in these alternative deals really changes the amount of competition that you're seeing um where in the public markets Everyone can see the competition all the time. It's all publicly available. It's all showing up on everyone's computer screens. Whereas without the, when the private markets, there's a lot less visibility. There could be a great business 20 minutes away from someone, but because it's a different deal size, 
that firm is never going to touch it. They're never going to look at That's it. Right. Never even going to see it. Um, that Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, something. Oh, I was going to say, I and mean, that's where the alpha is generated. So, because because public equity is, you know, by by definition at this point is is a very efficient market, and private equity, the larger deals, is increasingly more efficient. You can see, you know, in the '80s, they used to be able to put a bunch of debt on these businesses, and not do anything, and just wait. And then and then liquidate and make a ton of money. Now now private equity firms have to work a lot harder in order to get those returns. Uh, it's not as good as it was in the '80s because the market has become more efficient. Um, in these low in these in the lower middle market and sort of the main street premium space that we play in, uh, that's that's still true. There's a lot of alpha to be gained because it's an inefficient market because there's not a lot there's it's hard to find comps. It's mm -hmm. hard to find, you know, so we kind of just, we had these rules of thumb that we go by. Uh, and, you know, you can, you can get comps in certain places, like the SBA publishes data um, where you can kind of see, you know, what multiples things trade for. So we have metrics, but it's, it is by far um, uh, a much more inefficient market than, than pri big private equity or for sure public equities. Yeah, and we had a question I think is good to bring up from Chad. Um, Nick's typing an answer, but I wanted to bring it up live too. So, you know, Chad had been interested in running a search fund, but, you know, he was looking to invest his own IRA funds um, into, you know, this kind of opportunity that he was yeah, working yeah, yeah. on and he wasn't allowed to. So it's good to remember there is um, a rule called self-dealing um, and you cannot invest your own IRA into your own opportunities. So it's a conflict of interest and hits this self-dealing rule. So I always tell those people, sometimes they know a certain side of business really, really well. You can invest personal funds into anything that you'd like. With your IRA, you can invest in similar opportunities, but you cannot be connected to them. You have to be totally disconnected from previous ownership, um, previous family connections. And um, you know that's going to set you up for success. There is a very unique account called a Rob's account or you can invest your own retirement funds. It's complicated. The IRS doesn't like it. We do not sell it here, but um, that is something investors can really look for if they really want to do, but it's a riskier account strategy to go for. So um, if you are interested in business opportunities, yes, you can do these deals, but then you can't um, participate in both sides of Kevin business, Kevin's business. If you actually want to be someone that's considered as a business owner, you should not put your uh, IRA into fund one or fund two um, and, and exactly the opposite as well. Um, if you've already invested, you should not suddenly ask to be uh, a candidate for the fund that you've invested in. You should probably wait until the next fund because then your IRA does not conflict. So again, that's the prohibited transaction rules and that's the self-dealing rule that really comes back. That's an IRS rule, Rocket Dollar or Kevin did not make it. That's, that's what the IRS has set up. Um, yeah, I run a fellow the IRS. Um, Kevin, I also see, I don't know if you went all, over all these yet, but we do not invest into businesses with. A lot of these seem pretty self-explanatory to me. I That's think right. you mentioned yeah. to us why you don't invest in technology-centric businesses back when we yeah. first started talking, but maybe you could let the group know why some of those risk factors and why you avoid those businesses. Yeah, uh, we're not, you know, we're not allergic to technology. Um, if there were, and it depends on what you mean by technology, right? So when we say technology centric, what we're really talking about are SaaS based businesses that that are they're either going to be overvalued. There's not we we like durable assets. We can go put our hands on. So you will we'll, we can look at some of the examples later. But businesses we've invested in, a uh, couple towing companies. Uh, oh, specialty wiring manufacturer. Um, there's uh, commercial uh, hood cleaners for kitchens, like the 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 vent, uh, the hoods that are above the the stoves. Um, so those are the those are the kind of businesses that that are sort that are essential to the economy that that we like to be in. Um, it's not that we wouldn't invest in sort of an IT service company. Uh, we would. I actually like that space quite a bit. Um, but we're mostly talking about like the the businesses that are that don't have a lot of revenue. Uh, they're sort of pre market fit, um, technology centric. That's what we mean by that. Um, 
but I, but I'm like for managed service providers, if anybody, you know, is familiar with that, it's just outsourced IT, those are totally fine. That's, that's a normal service business as far as I'm concerned, but the rest of these, you know, not invest. Yeah, they, the, the, it is, it, this isn't, this isn't rocket science, right? Like we, we look at, we looking for good businesses. They happen to be yeah. small. Uh, so you don't, you don't want to make sure you want to make sure that your suppliers are diversified, uh, that you're not overly reliant on one supplier. Cause typically these suppliers, you know, they can be overseas. What happens if they shut their doors? You don't know what's going on geopolitically there. Um, that's a huge risk. So we make sure that supplier uh, bases are diverse, um, overly dependent on a few large customers, same, same story, different side of the coin, right? If you, if one, that customer goes out of business or decides, you know, they don't like the look of your face. Uh, and they're done with you, then you lose, you know, 40, 50, 60% of revenue. Um, that's not, that's not a good business. That's not, that's not a saleable business to what we would consider saleable. Maybe an independent, you know, an independent entrepreneur can go get it, but it's not a fit for us. We want to stay away from overly cyclical businesses. Duh. We'd like consistent cash flow. Technology centric, I, I touched on. And then rely heavily on the skill of the owner is actually, I mean, that's that's more. I think art and science is figuring out, you know, from the from the entrepreneur who's digging in, um, how how essential is this person to running the business? I'll give you a perfect example. So when I acquired my business, um, the owner had not been in the office in two years. Mm -hmm. Now that creates problems in the business, but it told me that hey, look, this business can throw off, you know, nine million, ten million dollars in revenue, and he's he's not even there. Um, so what, I, if I'm, if I come in the office every day and I'm, I'm actually, you know, leading the business, that's immediate, uh, an immediate impact I can have. Um, so, but I know that I'm not, I'm not essential to the day to day, right? Like I could, I could not come into the office for a week and this place would still run. You know, I'm not, it's, it's nice to say that I'm not that necessary. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more big picture and that's what we want our entrepreneurs to be too. They need the ability to, to dig down into the weeds. Uh, but then, you know, they need to live more up here, uh, at the 30,000 foot view. So yeah. we're looking for businesses that are 10 plus years old. Why sustainable trajectory avoids all the risks of a startup. Um, we're looking for B2B companies. We don't really want direct to consumer businesses. That's another reason we stay away from the technology centric businesses. There's a lot of these SaaS products are consumer focused. Um, we are not consumer focused. Uh, we like niche markets. Um, you, you could tell by some of the things that I said, right? Like uh, commercial hood cleaner, specialty wiring manufacturer. You know, like those are those are pretty niche businesses. I much, I own a textile company. You know, it's pretty harder, niche. Business. Much harder to copy paste that stuff. Some of the yeah products in oh, you know, yeah. three months, whereas a software as a service, you know, if a bigger company can just eat you alive in a couple months. If another another uh, sort of um, you know, brick and mortar example would be a landscaping company. A lot of people like landscaping companies. There's nothing wrong with landscaping companies, but I can go to Home Depot and buy a few mowers and be in business tomorrow if I wanted to, right? There's not a big barrier to entry there. So we we try we stay away from those. We want we want there to be some real assets in the business, if at all possible, um, because that's a bigger barrier to entry. If I got to outlay a million dollars to buy this truck, you know that keeps a certain amount of people out. It's expensive to get into this business. Are these we US like, only companies? Someone had a question. Great question. Yes, they're U.S. only because they need to be able to be financed by the SBA, and the SBA will only finance U.S. based companies as a government backed uh, program. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, and I talked about the size of the businesses, right? The one to two million dollar range. Yeah. Um, questions keep coming in, Kevin. So this is good. good. We appreciate all the questions. I want to make sure if you've got other sides, you've got about 20 minutes left. So um I've just got a couple. So I'm gonna leave the um the entrepreneur acquirer criteria. This is all pretty self-explanatory here. Conducted a self-funded search. We talked about the difference between I'm going to call it traditional or funded search and self-funded search. All that means is that we're not paying the entrepreneur's salary to look for a business. You look for it on your own time. You negotiate the deal on your own time. You get it under contract on your own time. You bring it to us when you need capital. That's our model. Instead of basically funding these guys up front to go out and run around and try and uh, find a business. Um, we're obviously looking for their, you know, their track record. We want to see, um, uh, we want to see a little bit of their own capital, a little bit of a skin in the game uh, that's going into the deal. Um, and then the the most, I don't know about the most important thing on this list, but kind of the the 
the secret sauce of all of this. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but you know, it's just it. personally guaranteeing the acquisition loan. That's the SBA piece. Those we're only right now investing in deals that have an SBA loan component. Why do we do that? Well, it's because there's potential for outsized returns because you're levering up the business. You're putting a lot of debt on the business uh, in order to, you know, juice the equity returns that that you would put into the business. It's a it's a classic private equity move, but the the beauty of it is that again, these are cash flowing businesses. Um, they and 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 the banks who are underwriting these deals are conservative. Uh, and they make sure that there's the debt service is able to be uh, able to be met with a healthy margin uh, that it's it's you know, it can weather some storms if you have a down tier. So last year was a was a down year uh, for me and the company. Just the revenue dipped a little bit because of interest rates rising and, and it's, you know, all those other things, just like a lot of other businesses. But we were we were fine because the bank, when we talked to the bank, we made sure we had a high enough debt service coverage. Same thing we do for all of our other entrepreneurs. Um, the nice thing too is, you know, with the fund, I mentioned diversification, you know, you could invest in one single business like my investors did with me and then, or you can invest in the fund that we created. So after, after going through the whole raise process and after realizing, Hey, this is kind of a broken model. What we ought to do is we ought to pool capital. And that way, if an entrepreneur has to raise money, they don't have to go to, you know, 300 individual people looking for $50,000 checks. They can go to one fund, get a five to eight hundred thousand dollar check, and clear out most of their capital raise with one with one investor. You know, a lot of obviously, time to fundraise. It's a lot of time to fundraise. It's basically a full time job. Um, you know, it t basically takes away a CEO. They're frankly, they're not running much. If you see a CEO fundraising, they're probably not running much of the company at that moment, unless they're staying yeah. up till midnight every single night. They are out there fundraising and going to get checks. Um, yeah, we had another question that's good from Lawrence. He asked us, uh, you know, I think it's about the mentality of like what you provide to these companies. I think he, what he, I'll say his question in a second, but I think he's asking, do you let these companies kind of do their own thing or do you give them like a templated model? So he's asking, do you give them templates or instructions on how to increase sales, profits? Um, like, do you give them templated marketing or accountants? Or do you kind of let them run that and their sales and their more specific operations on their own? Because you trust that you vetted that owner. Yeah, templating is probably the wrong way to 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 think about it. We we take part of the fund is that we take a board seat, so we do provide we do provide guidance uh, to the entrepreneurs. Uh, I I would I mean sure we can provide them examples and we can definitely refer them to service providers. And one of the great things about this space. And I, I imagine some of you will be in the same position if you if you choose to invest with us. People want to be involved. You know, there's there's people who want to be very passive, but then there's people who want to kind of give back and want to be mentors and want to you know want to have their their contact information available to an entrepreneur who has a question in X market or this function or whatever it is and whatever your expertise is, you want to be kind of on that phone tree to call. Mm -hmm. um, I, we have quite a few people who are, are interested in doing that. So well, that's one of the benefits of, of pooling capital is that we have access to, you know, I mean, how many great people uh, from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds that we can pull from. Um, I will say we use, we typically will reuse a lot of service providers, and that's because we have a good track record with them. So, for instance, like the accounting firm that I use and that I recommend for everybody, or I'm excuse me, the bookkeeping firm that I use and recommend for everybody is pretty common in this space. They do a great job. They're an outsourced, you know, bookkeeping firm. Um, it's it's both cheaper than hiring a full time person, and trust me, it's it's better quality. Uh, I've done both. Um, that's great. So we 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 tend we tend to have like a lot of people that share service providers. Um, so in that way, things could be templated, right? Because they're going to run their operations in the same way. But we don't necessarily give them like, okay, uh, new CEO owner, here's here's your here's your plan to increase sales. Like, no, we would we would want the CEO to think through that. Ideally, they have some idea before they buy the company, what they want to do with it. Um, that's very common, of course, as you might expect. Um, nobody's going to you know, take on millions of dollars and personally guarantee debt if they don't have a plan. Uh, the plan might be wrong and they might change it, but they ought to have some sort of idea what they want to do. Um, 
so yeah, I, it's it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of give and take, but but we do have you know we we take the board seat seriously, and we want to make sure that you know we have we're our investors' voices are represented, uh, in in the management meetings. Yeah, and uh, you know that's a it's a bit different than you know having like thirty five little investors or maybe you know just like a single human being compared to like a team like your team. Great, has. great point actually, and and I can just because like I said, we, I I bought my business before we started this fund. Otherwise, I obviously would have used this vehicle. Um, but I've got I think ten or ten to twelve people on my cap table. Um, now there's there's a lot of people at sort of the minimum check size. You know, it's a lot of capital for them to have invested in a business, but they don't necessarily have the amount of say that one large investor would have. So as the largest investor on the cap table, Fruition Capital, the fund, you and your capital carries a higher weight and priority with the with the entrepreneur within the business, right? Because we we have, I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. We have more power in the business because we have more equity invested in the business. Um, so we have a lot of influence, um, over operations and, and strategy. Yeah. A good retirement question came in here. And this, this is a really common one in, for our real estate investors too. So Jeff asked, um, I'll, I'll cover this one, Kevin, but Jeff asked, mm -hmm. what is the tax advantage of depreciating and write-offs if we are using our tax deferred accounts to grow our investments like his solo 401k or another investor with an IRA? So Jeff, the, the easiest decision you have to make is whether the tax benefits or costs are passed through to you. If you choose uh, to do it in a cash investment, forgetting rocket dollar, you will get um, maybe some tax costs as an investor will spin off to you through a K-1 uh, and some depreciation might spin off to you. Some people love that. Um, others, when they're in a, a solo 401k or an IRA, they don't get that depreciation and they go, Brendan, I love depreciation. What am I getting in return if I like miss out on the depreciation? What you're getting is absolute total protection from capital gain, 100% capital gain protection at all times. Um, you know, talk to your tax advisor. There's, you know, whatever that could potentially something could happen. But if you're in an IRA or a solo 401k, and there is a capital gain from the selling of off the investment or exiting of your investment. You are totally protected from that in a Roth IRA. If you're in a traditional IRA, you just have to, you can reinvest that money or you can slowly uh, pay ordinary income tax on that money. Most people don't take a million dollars or you know a hundred thousand dollars out of their traditional IRA all at the same time. They just take out little chunks and they pay income tax on it. So, do you want the depreciation? Go invest your cash. Forget Rocket Dollar. Do you want capital gains protection? invest through uh, an IRA or solo 401k. And some investors go, they go, look, I have plenty of investments in my IRA. I have different investments of all different different risk levels. Even if I'm not getting the depreciation in here, I think this is a good deal. I still want to do this deal. Um, and then I'll get that capital gain protection, which might not be a primary concern at that moment. But if this investment does turn out, I think it's going to do well. That protection will be there for you on the capital gain and the taxes in the long run. Um, uh, so Kevin, one for more for you, Bob asked, where do entrepreneurs find these businesses? Is Flippa a big source? Um, so it seems like you're having the, um, the candidates go out and search. You are not doing all the search for them. You're not really pointing directly at businesses for them or are you? Yeah, that's right. No, I mean, I talked to, I talked to, you know, budding entrepreneurs, searchers, sponsors, whatever you want to call them all mm -hmm. the time. Um. I've actually looked at a business on Flippa before uh, a couple different times. There's, I mean, it's, it's like um, biz by sell is like the big marketplace mm -hmm. uh, that's owned by CoStar. It's the same people that own LoopNet and and all those, you know, other aggregator type sites. Um, so that's the big one biz by sell, but, mm -hmm. but there's marketplaces like Flippa. Um, there's, uh, there's different brokerages uh, for, you know, there's online businesses, bro brokerages, um, FE International is another one. Quiet Light sells e-commerce businesses. Um, but don't then the there's brokers you know, call. Don't they do a lot of cold calling in the business brokerages? Do they just call businesses oh, yeah. and ask, "Do you want to sell your business?" Oh yeah, yeah. yeah because the the so that's that's the boy. Now we're, we we can get into a whole uh, thing on on that. But it's a lot of work to source these deals 
And that's what that's essential. So we're really only looking for on market deals, deals that are represented by brokers because they've put in the legwork that uh, frankly, me as somebody who's if I'm searching part time or I'm searching with my own funds, I'm not funded. Um, I need to be as efficient as possible. And to be efficient, uh, it's a heck of a lot easier and more uh, and, and more efficient to to go with a brokered deal. A, a deal that is being represented by a broker than to go call uh, Mr. Business Owner and try and develop a relationship with him or her and try and buy his business, you know, in a few months. You know, that's going to take a lot longer uh, and you just don't have that much time. So, uh, but yeah, I would, if you're interested in kind of just seeing some of the deals that are out there, look at Biz Buy Sell. Uh, it's, it's the best aggregator that's out there. It's not good. There's a lot of garbage on Biz Buy Sell, but it's the best we have. As um, with every aggregator website. Ever. Yeah, yeah. Your mileage may vary, you know. Uh, I did find that URL. Someone was asking, so I'm going to post it in the chat. In a yeah. Um, just wanted to jump in real quick. We had another question that was asked a little while ago. Just if some of these opportunities have become more prevalent as a consequence of the quarantine impact, uh, I'd probably also add the interest rate hikes. Yeah. So Kevin, have you just seen, I think, you know, this is part of like, you know, the silver tsunami. Um, this particular investor was asking, did COVID really try to like even add another level to this silver tsunami of these business changing hands or retirements and turnover? You know, I can, I can, I, can, I can't say broadly, but I can say specifically to my experience, I think the answer is undoubtedly yes. Mm -hmm. um, the reason my business was up for the business that I purchased was up for sale is that my uh, the the owner of the business uh his wife had some health issues they had just gone through covid um and it was he he told me he's like this is a couple of years before i really wanted to sell but life circumstances being the way they are um he took covid he was he took it very 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 seriously um obviously because they were immunocompromised and everything um so yeah i mean i i don't i don't think there's any way to to uh to to deny that 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 certainly had an impact and it sped up the timeline of a lot of people who are looking to retire yes. um you go you go through something like that where where you can't staff your warehouse you can't ship things out you can't you know you can't conduct business and then you get out of the pandemic you're like do i really want to do this again yeah. And that's, that's what a lot of, that's the sentiment from a lot of owners. Yeah. We don't, yeah. Some of these things you can find a lot of data on others, you know, you can't, but there are so many stories, just story after story of data of people, um, both, you know, self-employed people and people at corporate jobs, reevaluating their job, reevaluating where they lived, um, retirees kind of on the brink of retirement, maybe to retiring too early or too late. Some retired early and now have gone back because, uh, you know, their stocks were so down the last year or two. They were panicking and trying to figure out the panic of the stock market and make sure their retirement nest egg is big enough. So we've seen a lot of Americans really take a serious look, whether the pandemic was impacting them personally or not. Just a lot of people analyzed their own job position, um, vocalized it and made maybe some harder or bigger decisions that they'd kind of been avoiding or putting off for many years. So. I'm sure that's somewhere in the numbers. You probably just have to look at a lot of numbers to actually go find the impact. Yeah. Um, all right. We have about five minutes left, so I want to get through your slide here. Yeah. Let me just talk about the kind of the structure and and um, and the numbers on this page. So um, it's fairly easy to understand, right? This is a typical kind of two and 20 type structure. So you get a 2% management fee and then 20% uh, of the uh, profits after we achieve a 7% uh, return, which is otherwise known as a hurdle rate. So investors uh, receive, you know, what all cash is distributed to an, uh, LPs until they uh, achieve that 7% and then we split the profits in the 80-20 way. Um, minimum investment, 75,000. Again, diversified across you know, your, your portfolio of businesses and fund one. It's probably gonna end up seven or eight uh, for fund one. We've already done five. Your money, if you invested today, would be spread out among those businesses as well. As well. Um, and only accredited investors can participate in this fund uh, at, the, at this time. Um, if you look over on the left, you can kind of see, and by the way, all of our partners participate at these exact same terms. So I have money in the fund, 
this obviously the sponsor has money in the fund, Jason, uh, a couple of the other partners, all, all of us have some capital at risk in this fund. And we're paying, we pay the management fee. We pay, you know, we do, we, we invest at the same terms as all of our LPs. Um, internal rate of return, 24%. If you're used to commercial real estate, um, that's, that's a very attractive number. I, I will tell you that that's a conservative number. And it's because I mean, nobody can ever guarantee rate of return or anything like that. But let me tell you that when we underwrite these deals, we are looking for an IRR in their models. When they do the financial modeling, we're looking for 30% plus. Um, it's not a good deal if it doesn't model out 30% plus. Um, in fact, when I modeled out my deal, IRR was 50%. Now, is it going to return that? No. But we know that we know that there's going to be that float down gut correction but it's going to, it's going to be higher than 24%. Uh, you know, so there's, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, so this is a conservative projection. We, we definitely don't want to overpromise and under deliver. So we feel like this is a, we we're very confident in this number. We've, we've looked at it six ways from six ways from Sunday. So um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of the, the beauty of what we're doing here and, and working in that inefficient market um, that we talked about before. Um, it's, this is, this is, this is the beginning. Of, of a lot of activity in in this small call it micro private equity space um you know like there's going to be a lot of more retirements there's going to be uh people who are you know just looking to exit for whatever reason uh looking to take chips off the table especially as the economy rebounds um and you know especially as interest rates fall they're going to be just like houses right there's going to be more on the market uh and it'll heat back up again uh because interest rates you know drive the debt markets so um, that's that's the last slide I've got here. Um, I've got you know a bunch of slides in the appendix. I've, I can I can stick around for a few questions. Um, otherwise, here's my contact information here at the bottom. I'm pretty responsive on email. Um, I'd love to hear from any of you. And, and just if you're interested in talking about small business or you're interested in maybe you wanna maybe you wanna go buy a business yourself and you you know you want to use the fund for equity, ask. You know, come talk to me about it. Uh, or if you're obviously interested in being an investor, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Great. And I just want to give a general observation, Kevin. Someone asked about the website, um, and uh, I just want to say something about almost all accredited only opportunities. There's restrictions, both in fundraising, of what they can post online um, about various different websites. So uh, normally an accredited only website is pretty bare. You got to follow up with Kevin's team to get more information. So please do follow up if you want to get more personalized or custom information and I'm sure answer questions that you might have as an investor. Yeah, we don't want the SEC knocking on our door, right? Yeah, you post everything on your website. Um, there's plenty of SEC regulations that uh, if, if you're soliciting to non, uh, non-accredited non people, you can run into one file, plenty of that. But just wanted to answer that question um, so people you know still do follow up. Um, thank you, Kevin, for for stopping by. We had plenty of questions throughout the whole webinar. We're right about at our uh, hour. So last call for questions. We'll see if any more come in the chat. Okay, so um, Kevin, we got your we got your email up there, Kevin at uh, we got Beeblehausen. Right yep, right in the chat for everyone. Um, and then someone asked for the slides, so please do email uh, Kevin directly or info at Rocket Dollar. We'll make sure that Kevin gets the slides out there. Um, Kevin, we could probably attach that when we send out the recording notice as well. Um, we'll throw the slides. Sure. On yeah. Do you, yeah. We can talk about it. All right. Thanks so much, everyone.